everybody, welcome to Tech for Psych. I'm Dr. Cody Rawl, your medical doctor confidant. Today we are taking a look at something called the iBrain Connectome. In my last video, we took a look at a device called NextMind that could decipher where you are looking on a computer screen just by reading the electrical signals of your occipital lobe of your brain. The occipital lobe is what processes visual information. We've seen from previous presentations that if you could break down the code of what your brain is seeing, you could massively transform what you could do with brain computer interface. Recently, Gabe Newell of Valve Video Games, very widely known in the video game industry, said that if you are not considering these possibilities for the development of VR, AR, video games, and in other industries, if you don't have components of brain computer interface testing in your lab by 2022, you are going to be left behind. So we're gonna to talk to one of the top researchers in the world, Dr. Rani Habash, who recently was awarded a Flow 50 from Kernel that is a near infrared spectroscopy device designed to be able to track the blood flow of the brain. And you combine someone that's an expert of the eye brain connectome with a device that can decipher the blood flow of the brain and we'll see what happens. I'm really excited to speak with her. We're gonna learn about how you could diagnose cognitive impairment or dementia just by looking at the eye brain connectome of a patient. We're gonna learn about what the eye brain connectome could do for brain computer interface. And we're also gonna learn about how she shaped her own career and advice for you on how to shape your career if you wanna get into research, business, or development in this field. So let's take a listen and uh, learn a lot from Dr. Rani Habash. So Dr. Rani Habash, thank you so much for being on with me. I really appreciate your time. I know you're in clinic this morning and you're a very busy woman. Um, you're with the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute, which as we were discussing is such a hotbed of research activity, high technology through the University of Miami. And uh, could, could you just tell us a little bit about your background and what you do on a daily basis? Sure. Um, my day job is I am an ophthalmologist, so I cut up eyeballs for a living. Um, it's very gratifying, you know, giving patients their vision back. But being at Baskin Palmer, which is like the number one eye institute in the world for the past 18, 19 years, um, we have a lot of opportunities to see the worst cases in the world. You know, we're always the place that patients have gone seven other places before they get to us because nobody else could fix them. And so we, we see some really bad stuff from all over the world. And, you know, that's really prompted my, um, my passion for, you know, being able to solve these bigger problems for humanity um, through technology. And then I'm also like the chief medical officer for a technology company and also um, uh, did work with Microsoft's AI for health. So I'm kind of fusing all of those tech, business and medical um, and clinical backgrounds into one thing. Yeah, how's the Microsoft AI involved with that? Um, it's not involved with this um, specifically, but um, the uh, the Microsoft projects that we've done, um, we have devised algorithms to look at basically retinal photos and be able to um, identify diseases in patients, various diseases with just a photo. So the ultimate plan there, my ultimate world takeover plan is to make sure that you can go to Walgreens or CVS or whatever, have a picture of your retina snapped and then get an autonomous read about what's going on inside your eye. And that's really important because some of the most blinding, dangerous conditions are silent. You don't even know you have them. So people walk around and they don't even realize they're going blind from something until they've lost their vision and then it's too late to get it back. So if we can do early screening detection and treatment, then we can save um, a whole lot of eyes. Yeah, and how does brain imaging come into your research? Because you know we're talking about neurotechnology, taking a look at how the brain functions. And I don't think people realize how interconnected the, the eye and the brain are and how much implication there is in how we function in everyday life. So if you wouldn't mind yeah. speaking to that, I'd Absolutely. Yeah. The, uh, the way I, I say it for my patients is that your eyeballs are an extension of your brain, you know, and the optic nerve is sort of like the plug that plugs in your eyeball up to your brain. So if there's something wrong with the plug, you can't get the signal up to the brain. Um, and that's kind of my layman's explanation for this. But the eye brain connectome, you know, involves I mean, it's, it's the brain itself, it's an extension of the brain. And so you can learn a lot and you can study a lot about the brain through the eyes and vice versa. 
So here's a really perfect example. For instance, um, patients with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, we often see changes in the retina before anything happens um, cognitively. So before they have neurodegenerative disease, we're, we're able to pick it up in the eyes first. Um, and the, the same things you know, happen the other way too. So if you looked at the brain and you could study the, um, the signal to the visual cortex, like how strong that signal is, you can actually go backwards and see how much signal transmission is occurring from the optic nerve level. And that's what we do with glaucoma, for instance. We want to stage glaucoma, um, which is damage to the optic nerve. And there's a real simple way to do that. Just look at the visual cortex and see how strong that signal is. What kind of modalities have you been using up until now to take a look at the visual cortex? We'll talk about FNIRS in a, in a second with kernel, but were you using other modalities as well? Mostly fMRI. Yeah. Um, and uh, we, we have several ongoing studies actually using fMRI to do really... I mean, just a whole range of things. But one thing that's actually relevant for the neuropsych pathway is um, is ocular pain. And you don't hear about this very much. I mean, you'll, you'll hear some really extreme cases like post-LASIK patients who have pain and then want to commit suicide because it's so bad. But the, the problem is we can't really see where it's coming from because when we examine them, we don't really see anything wrong but they have this debilitating pain. And so one of the studies that we do is with an fMRI to induce pain in the, the, um, in the, the, the pathway, basically. So we shine a bright light or we blow some air on the eye and then have the patient in an F fMRI machine and then see what the pain pathway is um, up to the brain so that hopefully eventually we can stop that. The problem is the fMRI machine is expensive and long and loud and you can't really study or stimulate that way. So that's where the kernel device comes in. So is that a research study or is that an actual clinical test that you will do with people to diagnose an individual person with the fMRI? Well, um, it's a, the fMRI part is a research study, but we do this in, in clinic all the time. You know, we have tons of dry eye patients who come in and they say, I have pain in my eye or um, traumatic brain injury patients or um, patients with fibromyalgia. There's a million different things that cause pain, migraine patients. And we look and we, you know, the, the, the thing I love about what I do is that it's real objective. You either see it or you don't and you can fix it <laughs> if you see it. Um, but one of those things like um, ocular pain is elusive in that sense that we can't really see what's going on a lot of times and why the patient is so miserable. So if we can see what that pathway is looking like up to the brain, then hopefully we can stop it. Um, you know, there, We can put some feedback into it to stop that cycle. Yeah. And as you mentioned, the fMRI studies and machines are so expensive, and that is such a barrier towards what you're trying to do. How did you hear about Kernel and Flow50 and get involved with them? You know, um, I've always thought the next frontier of medicine is, um, is augmenting ourselves. You know, I, that's, that's kind of my belief that I, I want people to be the best versions of themselves. And for me, that's augmenting the brain. I think there's so much that we don't know or we, we can't really even conceive of. Um, you know, to, uh, one of the things I, I've always uh, thought is imagine an, an earthworm. Like an earthworm has two senses. They crawl one way, they, have, you know, they can just feel their way around, and they can sense very basic dark and light. They have no idea the rest of the world is around them. And that's like a really great example of the things that we don't even understand that we don't understand. So, so to me, the brain is the next frontier and unlocking all of those capabilities and being able to augment ourselves and make ourselves better and fix problems, even if it's bypassing the eyeball to go straight to the brain, which is kind of what we will probably talk about here in a minute. Um, you know, that's my passion. That's, that's where I think medicine is headed. And I want to be on the forefront of that. Well, I think it's great that you have been able to bring a fresh perspective to the um, the Flow 50 project, though, right? Because, I mean, um, you have a unique perspective on how the brain interacts with uh, the environment. And um, I'm sure Colonel really appreciated that. So did you hear about the announcement and then submitted an application? Is that how that worked? Or 
I mean, I've, I've been following Brian Johnson. I think he's brilliant. And I've been following Colonel um, and a lot of the brain machine interfaces um, companies like you have, you know, and uh, just following their work for a couple of years now and um, lecturing on it, giving presentations and, you know, all my colleagues think I'm crazy and out there or whatever, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, I really believe that this is the next frontier. So I've been following them. And then when Brian came out with the announcement, um, that's when I submitted our proposal on behalf of Bascom Palmer and all our research teams. Um, and so kind of wove, four major uh, research projects together um, to apply for the flow device. So it really revolutionized our research. That's amazing. And so does it kind of piggyback on the fMRI studies that you were doing to, to track blood flow? Exactly, right. So, so we're doing the fMRI studies for um, ocular pain. We're doing the glaucoma studies like we talked about. And then a bunch of um, vascular dementia, uh, neurodegenerative di disease like um, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, um, and then multiple sclerosis and stroke patients. I mean, there's unlimited use cases. Um, we've even been using gene therapy lately. And a lot of times it's really hard to gauge the effects of gene therapy unless you look at the visual cortex, you know, signal attenuation or the, the signal strength. Um, and so that's a really good application for as well. Yeah, I know you uh, haven't received the device yet, but um, what do you expect to be able to use it for? How, how is this going to take your research in an interest in a new direction? Well, for one, um, it's going to be easier to do. So, um, you know, going back to the pain study, like we talked about, um, it's really hard to blow air or light into somebody's eyes when uh, they're laying in an MRI, <laughs> an fMRI for two hours, you know, and uh, then the subject gets, it just ruins the study. It's not as clean as someone sitting there with a wearable device where you can really interact with the environment and, and see what they're sensing and what triggers those pathways. So that's one thing, um, you know, patients with, uh, with neurodegenerative disease or like um, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, a lot of times we follow the saccades of their eyes, like see what the movement is like in their eyes. Um, and we can gauge the severity of disease or even predict who's going to end up having those types of uh, diseases. So that's another really great way um, that we can use the device. Yeah, it's so exciting to just be able to have it uh you know, be incorporated into studies that really need it because of uh, how limiting the other modalities have been. Um, and you talked a little bit about this before, uh, where you've been interested in the in the brain for a long time and um, been taking a look at these companies. I, I, I speak to students a lot these days that uh, contact me off the YouTube channel, just asking for advice about what career path they should go in. And um, Honestly, the brain computer interface field is so widespread right now that it's hard to point anyone in any given direction. But if you could have some advice for someone that uh, would want to do something similar to what you're doing, what would be your advice to be to someone that's uh, coming up through education or thinking about starting a company or wanting to get involved in this field in any way? Yeah, um, I get this question a lot too. They say, what should I major in in college? You know, things like that, but it's impossible to do it that way. You know, you, um, cause, cause it really is applicable to many different fields. I mean, you could do psych, you could do, you know, sociology, you could do philosophy, um, and you can do engineering, of course. So uh, any of those things are fine. I think where I would start first is um, I would tell them to do a lot of reading about um, the devices, the different offerings out there, and the general premise, you know, because uh, brain computer interfacing is like a huge field and there's so many different applications for it. And it's sort of an extension of robotics and cybernetics. You know, we're just getting a little bit smaller and smaller. Um, there's different ways to do it, either injectables versus wearables. I mean, you kind of have to um, get to know the landscape first, and then you can decide what part of it really, really, you know, excites you, um, and then hone in on just that one part. Yeah, it seems like almost any field at this point could intersect with what's going on, um, but uh, at a certain point, you have to uh, start looking into interests you, but then also, um, I guess, interacting with other people in the field, right? So that you can have people understand what you're about so they can reach out to you if there's opportunities, right? How have you, how have you gone about, 
you mentioned earlier you've given talks and just been vocal about your interests. Um, how, how about about that side of the coin? How do you um, make it known that you're into this uh, field and this is what you're, you know, interested in and, and working on? You know, a little bit of self promotion, I guess, is required at a certain <laughs> point sometimes. Yeah, uh, this is always un uh, uncomfortable, you know, for me. But uh, I, I get uh, I get invited to a lot of talks and a lot of presentations, and they're to very educated audiences, which is perfect. You know, that's what we I want to educate my peers and my colleagues. Um, and so I, I feel like a lot of times we just talk about the same old stuff all over again. Um, but I I always am trying to push the limits to. Um, make people think sort of out of the box and expand their minds a little bit. Um, and that's why, like, anytime I'm, I'm asked to speak, I try to always pick something creative or something out there, something to get people just thinking ahead. Um, and so lately, you know, anytime I've been asked to do something, it's always, oh, I've got just the thing, brain machine interfacing. <laughs> yeah, I think you and I have that in common. You know, I would do mental health talks, and it seems like every talks about the new to, newest uh, way to diagnose, I don't know, borderline personality disorder or something like that. And, uh, you know, that's all well and good. And, you know, it's an important part of the field. But, uh, you know, I think that there's not very many people talking about these technologies, although I do think it's going to change pretty quickly due to will, the yeah. amount of data fidelity we're about to get here. Yep. Would you be able to comment on that at all when you take a look at the, these new devices that are coming out and um, how they would compare to an FM, fMRI machine compared to consumer wearables that have come out before? What's your gauge on where we're headed and how actually important the data that is coming out of these devices could be? Oh, yeah, I mean, that's a loaded question. Um, so let me let me step back just a second sure. and remind everyone of you know how big our mainframe computers were just a few years ago. You know things have changed and things are changing all the time, and devices are getting smaller and more precise all the time. Like the kernel flow device, you know now we have this amazing device which gives you you know all the. Um, information that an fMRI machine would give you plus more, you know, a much more precise detail. Um, and then it has added functionality, which means that it's wearable, it's small, it's inexpensive, um, and it can be a consumer device, which is a total game changer. You know, I, I even uh, say it to my peers, you know, we always talk, we always laugh about this. Our patients are consumers now. Like they want, you know, they want all their data. They want to know everything about what's going on with themselves. And that's great. I want to, I applaud that. I think that's the way it should be. Um, and one of those things, just like any, you know, Apple watch or Fitbit device or whatever is, is going to be the brain, um, you know, brain monitoring as well. It's an exciting time. And I really appreciate you calling in and teaching us about yourself and your initiative. And I can't wait to see what, uh, you know, comes from the research studies and uh, looking forward to touching base more in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this and for the awareness that you're uh, garnering for, for this topic and, uh, and for having me. So I appreciate it. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Dr. Rani Habash. Be sure to subscribe so I can continue bringing you world-class experts that will educate us on brain-computer interface technologies. I have so much more coming in the next couple of weeks to months. So stay tuned. This is Dr. Cody Rall with Tech for Psych. See you next time real soon.